Good to know my sons are faithful to me. I don't know why. I don't know what what you were doing back here. <laughs> no. That whole family's faithful to me, Gary. They're gonna tell on you every time. <laughs> All right, Romans chapter five. We've, uh, you know, the message this morning, his brother gave on denominationalism. Denominate, listen, all through the Bible, there's a, there's a conflict, a spiritual conflict in the Bible. And Satan has, Satan has uh, devised a plan, and in every dispensation, what, what the brother was talking about, Keith Blades always talks about Satan's policy of evil, right? And Satan always devises these policies that run our world that are contrary to what God is doing. Uh, Paul talks about the course of this world being according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And uh, what Satan's policy of evil is in the day that you live in is denominational Christianity, religion, right? Paul wrote over there in 1 Timothy, he told Timothy to charge some that they teach no other doctrine, right? When he writes 2 Timothy, now what, what's 1 Timothy about? It's about godliness and the mystery of godliness. Well, what's 2 Timothy about? This thou knowest that all of Asia be turned away from me. It's a departure from the doctrine given through the Apostle Paul, right? What is, what is a departure from that doctrine? It's iniquity. All of 2 Timothy is about iniquity and ungodliness. They will have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Satan's policy of evil today is Catholicism. United Methodist. Church of Christ. Seventh-day Adventist. You know, people, I, I, I grew up listening to the Baptists say, I believe Baptists are closer to the truth than anybody. Which ones? Yeah. Yeah. You got free wills, regular, primitive, unite, or uh, American, Southern, yeah. independent, sword of the Lord, Ruckmans, Ruckmanites, you know, all this stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, folks. We're not looking to get close to the truth. God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Not close. Amen. Not pretty close. Amen. He wants us to know the truth. That's why he gave us this book. Amen. Yeah. Romans chapter 5. We've been looking at the four cornerstones speaking of truth. Right? We've been looking at the four cornerstones of the faith that God has made known to us. Right? Uh, Romans 16, the verse he read this morning, it was made known to all nations, to all nations for the obedience of faith. And so these four cornerstones here in the book of Romans that Paul lays down here for us to be established upon. Uh, the, the beginning of Romans speaks of being established. The end of Romans speaks of being established, right? Romans 1, 11, he says, he says, uh, uh, he said, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. How? By the mutual faith in verse 12. In chapter 16, verse 25, the hymn that is of power to establish you, right? According to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of, of the everlasting God made known to all nations for... The obedience of faith. So what, do you, what is the book of Romans? The book of Romans is the book upon which you are to be established. 
And in this book, Paul lays down four cornerstones of this foundation uh, upon which our faith is to be subject to this faith revealed by God, right? Your faith, listen, you obey God today by having your faith in subjection to his word, not a bunch of religious ceremony. You don't obey God by giving him money. You don't obey God by coming to an altar and telling him you're going to do better. You don't obey God by getting, your, getting dunked in oil and water and all this other stuff, getting prayed over, getting hands laid on you. You obey God today by having your faith subject to his faith, what he's made known. Okay? That's how we obey God today. It's called the obedience of faith. And the first pillar, the first cornerstone we looked at was the righteousness of God declared in the gospel of Christ resulting in our free justification by faith. Freely justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. We are justified 100% freely by God and through his righteousness, Right? The reason a lot of people don't have assurance today is because their faith has never been rooted and grounded in the righteousness of God. Yeah, right? Yeah. right? Israel, Israel was ignorant of that righteousness, and because of that, they continued to establish their own. You can tell a man who has trusted in the righteousness of God apart from a man who hasn't. The man who hasn't continues to establish his own. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believeth. What well, they haven't believed, what? They're still trying to establish their own righteousness through the works of the law. Right? And so, and so the righteousness of God, that is the first, the first cornerstone of our faith is not us, not our righteousness, not our repentance, not some religious experience we had 25 years ago. Our faith today is rooted and grounded upon, number one, the righteousness of God. Now we come into chapter 5. The second pillar deals with the grace of God. Look in Romans 5, 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death. So how did sin reign unto death? Through that one single man's disobedience and the law of God, right? Right? As sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through what? Was that your righteousness? <laughs> it ain't my righteousness. God's grace doesn't reign through my righteousness. God's grace reigns through his righteousness and the righteousness of his son. You have access now to the grace of God because of their righteousness, not yours. Right? And the purpose of this grace that now reigns through righteousness, the purpose of that grace and righteousness is to bring eternal life. To get rid of the death that came by sin. Right? Grace now reigns. This is our program today. Right? Once you're justified by faith, Romans 5, 2, once you're justified by faith, we have access into what? Look at it there in Romans 5 too. Access into this what? This grace wherein we stand. Right? Once you got justified through the righteousness of God, you now have access into the grace of God wherein you now stand. Amen? You say, how long do I have a standing in grace? How long is God's righteousness going to endure? How long, how long is the righteousness of this one single man right here going to endure? Your access to grace is through him. That's right. And so from the moment you get justified, you now positionally stand in the grace of God. It is perfectly fine for you folks to take the law of Moses and be done with it. And I know it just, oh, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know why? You've yet to see the righteousness of God. That's why you can't do it. There you go, yeah. preacher. Amen. Did Paul have a problem writing that Jesus Christ took it and nailed it to his cross and took it out of our way? Did Paul have a problem saying it? 
No, he didn't. The law is only going to do one thing for you. And it's going to give you the experience of sin and death. You cannot experience the life and righteousness of Jesus Christ under the law. You can only experience it through the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Now you have positional access. But as I pointed out Wednesday night here, the great subjects of Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, the great subjects of these chapters is sin, death, the law, righteousness, life, and grace. Those are the great subjects of these chapters. Amen? Sounds like six pretty good things to learn about, don't it? I tell you, the religious world's messed up because they don't understand these four chapters. Right? By the time you come out of chapter 8, if you've understood what you've read in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, you're going to understand everything there is to know about sin, death, righteousness, Grace, the law, life, everything. You're going to know how to live. You're going to know how to die. Right? You're going to know, you're going to know where your sin came from, why you are who you are, why God gave you the law. But you're going to also understand how righteousness and life operates now through the, through, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're going to understand everything. Right? I'm telling you right now, the way religion makes a living today is off of your ignorance. A man, um, listen, a man, listen, every church in Fairmont would be shut down tomorrow. People just read these four chapters. These four chapters have enough truth and power in them to shut down every false church in Fairmont next week. People just read and believed them. Amen? Look there, life and death. Look, look, at, look at Romans 5.12. Just look down through some of them verses. Tell me I'm lying. When I get up and make a statement, folks, listen, you're not dealing with somebody that just makes stuff up up here. When I get up to preach a message, man, when I make a statement like the subjects of these chapters or this, 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 and this, it's because I've studied them. 512 is death in the verse. What about 514? What reigned? Look down there at verse uh, look down there at verse 17. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Look at that reign in life by one. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know how to reign in life? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because I'm telling you, man. In anybody, anybody that's lived on this earth for any amount of time, you drive, drive up here, go up here and turn down there by Dairy Cream and drive out there towards Morgantown Avenue and look up there to that big yard they got there with all them monuments to the king of death. Talking about a cemetery, folks. Death reigns. It did rain. Death is a reality. Right? And here's, here's a chapter dealing with life and death. Look at, look, at, look at verse 18. Justification of life. There at the end of the verse. Look down there at verse 21. That his sin hath reigned unto what? Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. If you want to understand life and death, you're going to have to have a principal understanding of these two things right here. You can't understand life and death if you don't understand law and grace. The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, how? By the law, even so might grace now reign through righteousness unto eternal life. Amen. Yeah, see if Joel's talking about it when you go home today. See if Joyce Meyer and all them clowns are talking about this stuff when you go home today. Right? You're five chapters into the apostle of this dispensation and you're still dealing with a world that's ignorant of these things. Amen. Look at 6-2. Look at, look at How shall we that are what? Dead. 
Look at, look at, look at verse 3. You see his death. How about verse 4? We are buried with him by baptism into what? Death. See that newness of life at the end of the verse? Look at verse 5. His death. His resurrection. Right? Verse 7. He that is dead. Verse 8. Now if we be dead, we believe that we shall also live. You can't make it a verse in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 without reading the words death and life. That's what they're about. Look at, look at verse. So listen, if you're going to understand, if you're going to understand who you are now, you have to understand these things. Who you are. Why, why death came. Who you are now in Christ. And all this stuff, you have to understand it. Look in verse, verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. You know what that is? Boy, right there, right there is the greatest definition of life and death you could ever have. Right? What does it even mean to be alive? What, walking around? You ever, you ever read that verse over there in Timothy where Paul said, She's dead while she yet liveth? What does it mean to be dead? Right? What does it mean to be alive unto God? Well, it's going to have to, listen, life and death deals with your relationship to sin and righteousness. A man that's bound to sin is a man that's in death. A man who cannot live unto righteousness is a man that's dead to God. And here's the reality. <clears throat> Before the cross work of Christ, that's who you were. You, you got, I mean, listen, I know this is, this is, I hope it's not too deep. But if you want to understand what it means to be alive and dead, somebody who's dead is a man that's bound to sin. A person who's freed from sin and alive unto God is a person who now through, through being freed from sin has become a servant of righteousness. And this, can, this is only going to come by grace. But I want you to just see down through there. Look at verse 23. The wages of sin is what? The gift of God is what? Look at 7 1. Know you not, brethren, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he what? <laughs> but if the husband, look at verse 2. But if the husband be, okay. Look at verse 4. Ye also are become. Okay, but, but you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the. <laughs> Look at verse five. See that bring forth fruit unto what? Death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being. <laughs> Do we need to keep going? How about how about how about seven seven nine? I was alive. Without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I, boy, Paul just told you what death was, didn't he? He just defined death. And you still got people coming over here that thinks, you know, when Paul says be carnally minded as death, they think that means going to hell. They don't understand anything in these passages, man. And this is the foundation of our faith. Say, I can't understand it, preacher. Well, I'd tell you what, you better make it a priority to understand it. I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying, man, that, that you, you have to understand it today or tomorrow, but I'm telling you right now, if you can't understand it, it should be your priority, number one, to understand it. Why? God made it known for the obedience of faith. All right? Look at verse 10, death. Verse 11, slew me. Verse 13, death. Look at chapter 8, verse 13. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Paul just told you how to live and die. 
He just told you how to live and how to die. Right. You know what they do? They're still up here at this altar looking for life. As if it comes through what they do. What did Paul just say? If you through the what? Spirit. There's only one thing in this world that can make the death of Christ a reality in your life. There's only one thing in this world that can take that old man and experientially put him to death with the Son of God. So that you and yourself can experience the resurrection of the Son of God also. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. Ministered through the Word of God. Remember when Paul said, he talked about who he was in the flesh and he said, I've suffered the loss of it all that I may know him. That I may know him. Right? And so, last Wednesday night we started looking at this. Do y'all see what the chapters are about? I hope you see it. It's about death and life. And what causes death and life? What causes, what causes death? Sin. What causes life? Righteousness. Well, how do we get those things? Law or grace? Okay. Now, look, look there in Romans chapter 5. This is what we started looking at last Wednesday. There's two sections to Romans 5, 6, and 7, and you better get them. You better understand them. One, the first section is about positional identity. Who God made you by your baptism into Christ. Now it's going to be hard for a lot of people that don't even know that they've been baptized into Christ. Right? But who God made you? Right? Am I dead? Yeah. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. You know what that is? That's a statement of identity. Paul understood it. Paul's saying, this is who I am. I am crucified with Jesus Christ. This man who I was in Adam was put to death with Jesus Christ on the cross. So this sinner that I was condemned to death, that man has been put to death with Jesus Christ. That's not who I am anymore. Okay? It's posi and listen, it has nothing to do with your experience. This is who you are now through the obedience of Christ, right? Has nothing to do with your experience. We'll get to the experience later. The experience will not come until you learn who you are in Christ. Positional, right? And so the second section deals with experiential identity. How do I live this life out? How do I... How do I live out this new life in Jesus Christ? God put you in Christ so that you could walk in newness of life. How do I walk in this newness of life? Right? In Romans chapter 7, 7 through 25, Paul gives us the experience of death. Paul experienced that. How did he experience it? By going back under the law. Got it? If Romans 7 is your experience, there's something wrong with your Christian life. You got to understand that. If grace is not reigning through righteousness unto eternal life, but sin is reigning unto death, like it is in Romans 7, when Paul cries out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What's reigning in him? Is life reigning in him or death? Is sin reigning in him or righteousness? <clears throat> that should not be your experience as a Christian. But it will be if you put yourself back here. That's going to be your experience. Let me ask you this. I'll tell you what Paul asked Peter. Is Christ the minister of sin? You know, have you got the guts to say that one? Is Christ the minister of sin? Because that's what's going on in Paul's life in Romans chapter 7. 
He's in captivity, folks, to the law of sin and death. Is Christ a minister of that? No. What ministers? What is that administration? That's the administration of the law. Right? The reason most Christians only experience death in their Christian life is because somebody's put them under the wrong administration. Amen? Now, last week we looked at Adam and Jesus Christ there in Romans chapter 5. I ain't going to go back over it. You read these verses here. By, one, by Adam's disobedience, we were all brought under condemnation. What was that condemnation? Death. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And because we were sinners, that's your identity. That's who you are in Adam. Right? There's an old saying that Baptists use all the time. It's a pretty good saying. He said, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. There's nothing that can fix that. Right there is what God judged upon sinners. You couldn't fix them. Right? What was the judgment? Death. Right? So what happens to a sinner? He dies. Verse 20, Paul says the law entered. Now let me ask you, when did the law come? Did the law come because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins or did it come because of Adam's disobedience? So what is the law for? It's for sinners. You got that? It's not for the righteous. Paul said it in Timothy. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man but for the godless and disobedient, for the profane and the unholy. So, this law was for who? This group here, right? But through the obedience of Jesus Christ, we received not condemnation of death, but justification of life. We were made righteous, verse 19. All this is in opposed to Adam. By his disobedience, condemnation, through that man's obedience, justification of life. Through that man we were made sinners. Through this man we're made righteous. The law entered because of Adam's disobedience. Grace came because of the obedience of Jesus Christ. You get access into the grace of God. You don't earn it. Grace cannot be earned. You get access into the grace of God because of what Christ did. And it is a spit in the face of, of the grace of God to think that anything that religion is doing today <coughs> somehow gives us the right to grace. You say, how do I get grace? Out of the Bible. I know, I know this, this is hard for some people to imagine. You're receiving grace right now. Remember when Paul wrote in Corinthians or Philippians, I said, ye are all partakers of my grace. Mm -hmm. How? Through their fellowship in the gospel. Right? Remember when he said over there, death worketh in us, but life in you. Remember, remember when he said that? Death worketh in us, but life in you. Big part of that Bible is about life and death, folks. And so you understand these two identities here. And so, because of these two identities, God gave two ministrations. Depending on who you are, <coughs> depends upon which one of those ministrations. Right? Now, now, one of these, this is important for you to get, one of these ministries work death, the other one works life. Do you know that? You know what that Bible is? That Bible, from cover to cover, is the ministries of life and death. You don't believe it? Just keep playing games with it. That book's going to kill a lot of people. Yeah, I said the Bible's going to kill a lot of people. You don't believe it? Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll show you. There's a whole nation of people right now on their way to hell... 
Through who? Because they trust in the law. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Who hath made us able, see that word, ministers? Hath made us able ministers of what? The New Testament. Not of the, but of the Spirit. Is that a capital S or a little s? Little s. Small s. Right? So what are we ministering today? We're ministering spirit, the Spirit. We're ministering to the Spirit. We are, not, we are not ministering things written on stone in letters. Through what we're preaching and ministering today, we are putting these things in the Spirit of man. We are literally <coughs> part of this ministration of life. Right? Well, what was written on what was written on stone? Let's look at the way Paul describes it. What was written on the letter killeth. That don't sound good. Right? We got we got a set of Ten Commandments back there in that foyer hanging up on the wall. You know what that was the ministry of? That was the ministry of death. This is what God says about it. Don't worry about me. I know what God, this is what God says about his law. Look, look, look at what he says next. If you look down through there, I don't have the verses wrote down. Uh, the, the, he says, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And then he calls the letter the ministration of condemnation. Down there around verse 9, I believe it is. Yep. The administration of condemnation. Look there, look, look up there in verse, uh, I believe it's verse, verse 14 maybe where he talks about the minister, that ministration being done away. They, they, could not, they could not see to the end of that which is done away. Who's men, that's Moses folks. What about it? His ministry was death, condemnation, and it was to be done away. Right? Well, let's look at the other administration. There's a ministration of the Spirit. What's it do? It gives life. I don't know, guys, but to me, when something kills you and something gives you life, it's pretty much the exact opposite. Kind of like that secret and what was spoken, you know. Yeah. A, person, a person that's going to sit and argue with you about something that kills you and something gives you, giving you life is the same... That's a reprobate that you, I mean, you can't, you ain't going to get very far with them. The ministry of the Spirit gives life. It's not the administration of condemnation. It's the ministration of righteousness. And the old, men, the, the ministration of the law was done away and this ministry remaineth. <coughs> For how long? Well, Paul comes in chapter 4 and calls it eternal glory. He's saying that glory, he said, think about it now. He said, Moses, what Moses got was so glorious they had to cover his face. He said, if, that, if the ministry of death and condemnation and, and all those things was so glorious they had to cover that man's face, how much more glorious is ours? He said, we ain't covering our face. He says, we're beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And being changed into that same image from glory to glory. That's what this ministration is. What is it? It's the administration of the life and glory of Jesus Christ. Paul said we have this treasure in earth and vessels. This ministry bill is working in me a glory. That though this outward man, this fleshly man. Though he's perishing... And dying, you see it, life and death again. There's part of me dying. But there's a part of me being renewed day by day by day. And one of these days, that glory is going to be revealed. We have the administration of eternal glory, right? Now look here in Romans chapter 6. I know, listen, that's just an overview of this stuff. Let's 
sinners or condemned to death. God gave the law to God. God gave the law to kind of administer that death. The righteous get life. God gave us His grace to administer that life to us. Okay, so it's important we learn how to live under grace. How do you live under grace? Well, you live under grace through faith. I know, I know this is, people spend all their life treating God like a genie. And they don't believe God until they see something, some little thing happen in their life, you know. Yeah. I woke up this morning and my, my little angel trinket moved 10 inches across the table and I just know God was showing me a sign and all this yeah. stuff. They won't believe unless they have experiences like that. I know, man, when I'm sitting with my open King James Bible and I'm reading Romans through Philemon, I know exactly what's taking place. That is the administration of the grace of God. And when I left all that other mumbo-jumbo stuff alone and just started putting my nose in that book, man, the Word of God started working effectually in me and Bill, listen, Christ is no longer this, this man that's, you know, up there at the right hand of God that I don't know. He's becoming personal. Amen. I'm beginning to know his love, his righteousness, his wisdom, his knowledge. Being changed into that same image from glory to glory. Where do you behold that glory? You behold it in the administration of grace. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So, look here in Romans 6 now. The second section on your position. You understand the positional identity of this. Right there's one identity. Right there's the second one. Right? Who you in? The second section deals with our positional identity by baptism. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm, I'm not going to, listen, folks, I'm not going to keep you long. Now, all this stuff is just an overview anyways. When we get over to here, you're going to see how every bit of this ties back to this stuff. You see that Adam and Jesus Christ? Paul's going to talk about the flesh and the spirit over here. Right? You walk after the flesh, that's where that man's sin and death is. You walk after the spirit, that's where that man's life and righteousness is. You don't believe it? Paul said, Romans 8, 10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. The spirit is life because of righteousness. Right? But look there in Romans 6, 3, positional identity by baptism. Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ or baptized into his death. What does that even mean? To a bunch of people that's got water on the brain, it don't mean much. Right? To people that's been fighting about sprinkling and immersion and getting dunked upside down and, you know, all this stuff, what name it was in. And for people that's been fighting about that stuff for 2,000 years, that verse don't mean anything to them at all. Notice the phrase, know ye not. You know what that means? When Paul, Paul don't use that phrase after the book of Galatians. It's only in Romans through Galatians that Paul says, know ye not. You say, what is it? It's a rebuke of ignorance. It's a rebuke of not knowing something that is essential. Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one, you know, all this stuff. But here he says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. What does that even mean? I spent 20 years in church. I still never heard anybody talk about it. I heard Dr. Ruckman talk about it. I'll give Ruckman credit where credit's due. Ruckman understood this stuff. 
But the re- most of the religious world, I've, I've, I've even, I'll even give Oliver Green credit. Oliver Green understood the passage. But the majority of the world, they see baptism and they just, they just lose it. <coughs> That's one of Satan's policies of evil. What's the mystery? That you've been made one with Christ. Well, what's the, what's the surefire way to make sure you never see that? Take every time baptism's in the Bible and make it water. Yeah, boy. What does it mean to be baptized into Jesus Christ? Ephesians 1. This is the mystery, folks. God's son went to a cross and died to redeem you. He was buried, rose from the dead, and ascended back to the right hand of God. That's where prophecy left off. Prophecy don't tell you anything until that man comes back at the second coming. Set at my right hand until. That's an undisclosed period of time in which the Son of God is going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And the prophet saw nothing about what he's doing up there right now. When we talk about preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, this is what we're talking about. Is that God has now made this stuff known. Look in Ephesians 1.19. This is what Ephesians is about, folks. I love the book of Ephesians. You know why? You see these, you see these princes and principalities here in the heavenly realm? These princes and powers? Right? When Jesus Christ went to heaven, Bill, you know what he did? He led our captivity captive. He spoiled them all. He is now seated above them. As the head of all principality and power. Satan don't want you to see that. Look at Ephesians 1.19. So what's this got to do with Romans 6? Everything. Just bear with me. Ephesians 1.19. That you might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who what? Which he wrought in Christ. The power that's to you that believe is the power that he wrought in Christ when he what? Raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the what? Heavenly places far above all principality and power and gave him. Come down to verse, I think it's verse 22. And gave him to be the head over all things to the what? Which is his what? There it is. You see that? When you got saved, you were identified. How do you get into that body? Come to to Ephesians 4. God is making a new creation today, folks. When we talk about getting baptized into Jesus Christ, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about getting water sprinkled on your head. I'd love to know how in the world getting wet is ever going to associate you with a man that's seated at the right hand of God. Let me ask you this. How many of you believe there's baptized people in water that are no more associated with the body of Christ today than a rock or a, or a, or a, a, a fruit bat or whatever? I mean, come on. Is water baptism have anything to do with what we're talking about? Then why are we fighting about it? Look at Ephesians 4, 3. Say, what do you got? What do you got against water baptism? Nothing other than it's it's tore the body of Christ to a thousand pieces for the last two thousand years. Endeavoring to keep the unity of what? In the bond of peace, there is one, how many, how many bodies? How many spirits? Even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, he's up here. 
One faith. That's here. One baptism. Now, if I say one orange, you don't have a problem. If I say one apple, you don't have a problem. If I say one kid, one tree, one car, you all understand it. The only reason one baptism is hard for people is because of what religion has done to their mind. You better believe it. What baptism you think it is? Listen, there's only one baptism that gets you in the bo into the body of Christ. Only one. Right? And it's defined in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit. Remember that one body and one spirit? By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 8 and 9. Yep. Yep. How do you receive the Spirit? Works of the law or by the hearing of faith? All right. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So what are we talking about? We're talking about your identity. The moment you believe the gospel, the spirit of God identified you with the dead, buried, risen, and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. You think Satan wants you to know that? You see why he hates the mystery? Right? You see why he wants you getting in religion and fighting about water baptism and all this stuff? Let me ask you something. Can you, uh, do you understand the difference between water and spirit? Because I do. You see this unity of this one? Are you about to let that? Destroy this unity here. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Amen. Now Paul says that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his what? Right? We are buried with him by baptism. We are buried with him. There, we were baptized into his death. We are buried with him by baptism so that as he was raised here by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's your identity. That's why God put you in his son for you to experience this right here. You were baptized into his death so that you can live. You were baptized into his death so that you could have the power of his resurrection. Right? This is our positional identity. His death, his life. And I'm going to read you just a few verses and I'll be done. We'll pick up Romans 7 next week with the, with the law. Because don't forget about what Paul's dealing with here is these two things here. Right? Death. We were baptized into the death of Christ. What does that mean? That means this old man's crucified with him. Right? By being baptized into his death, we can now partake in his life. Right? That's what this is about. When he gets into chapter 7, he's going to talk about the law. Through the death of Christ, we've also been delivered from the law. Because now we are joined to him who is raised from the dead and we've been made alive unto God. And I, you know, I ain't got time to get into all that. But let me read you some verses here. Uh, Romans 6, 7.
Say, I don't understand this preacher. Well, you've got enough to go home and study it now. At least give you that, right? Romans, Romans 6, 6. What does it mean to be baptized into his death? Well, knowing this. You see that word knowing? Paul ain't talking about you experiencing anything yet. He just wants you to know something. And don't fight against the knowledge. How many of y'all believe Romans is the word of God? Well, here's what Paul says. He says, knowing this. That means that must be crucial knowledge. That our old man is, is crucified with him. Now, did you feel that? Did you experience that? <laughs> I was put to death within an event that took place 2,000 years before I got here. Yeah. There ain't nobody asking you to feel or experience anything. They're telling you to know something. Yeah. Right? The knowledge has to come first. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7 changed my life, Bill, when I believed it. It rocked my world when I finally believed it. Was I crucified with Christ? Yeah. He that is dead is, is, is freed. From sin. That rocked my world, Bill. Not, not, not through, I don't, I don't, I'm not dead to sin through what I do. I'm dead to sin through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm freed. I'm freed. Is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. But by my union to Jesus Christ, that sin in my flesh has already been condemned and I've already been justified by His life. So what am I supposed to do now? Verse 11. Reckon. See that word reckon? You know what that means? It means quit fighting against the knowledge. Be in subjection to what God has made known. If God says you're crucified with my son and alive unto me through my son, then reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God. Amen. So what does this all mean? And I'm, I'm closing. I had a lot more on this stuff, folks. We'll get into Romans 7 next week. What does this mean? Through his death and life, my relationship to these things up here has changed. I was a sinner under the condemnation of death, but now I'm freed from sin. You see how the cross of Jesus Christ gave me a new relationship to sin? Yeah. And because I'm now free from sin, how did death reign? Death reigned by what? Sin. So now being made free from sin, guess what no longer reigns over me? Death. Amen. Death has no more dominion over me. Amen. Not only did my relationship to sin and death change, but my relationship to life, to righteousness and life changed. When you were the servants of sin, what were you free from? You were free from righteousness. Now being made free from sin, you've become servants unto what? Righteousness. And being made servants unto righteousness, what now reigns? Eternal life. What a thing. What a thing. And all this just positional. It gets better. This is just positional. You know, I tell, I tell, I tell people all the time, I love positional doctrine in the Bible. I love it. But the, 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 the true beauty, folks, is that it's not just positional. You know, there's, there's nothing, there's only one thing in this world that I enjoy better than this. Right? That I'm seated up here by one spirit with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. That's my position. Right? Seated in heavenly places. There's only one thing that I enjoy more than that. And that is 
through the ministry of the Spirit of God, Christ in me is the hope of glory. There's something I love more than understanding that I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I love knowing Christ in me. Amen. That's why God gave you that position. Why did he set his son up here? That his son might feel all things. That's why he's up there. That's the mystery, right? And so, through the death of Christ, this old man here has been put to death. You might as well just wipe him off the board. Amen. That sinner condemned to death is gone. This is who now lives. And through your union to him, your relationship to God, righteousness, and life has now changed. Right, the grace of God ought to be reigning through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything Adam caused should, have, should be being brought to nothing through the cross work of Jesus Christ. Any questions on any of that? All right. Um, I hope y'all understand it because it's, it's kind of, it's, it's really kind of simple once you do start understanding it. But what, you, what I want you to get is that righteousness, righteousness is a gift of God received through grace. We're not just talking about imputed righteousness. We're talking about if you want to be righteous in your walk, righteous, listen, a righteous man ain't out here not killing people. If you could see the heart of, of, of a person who's never committed murder, you'd still think that was an ungodly man. Righteousness doesn't come through not doing things. Righteousness is an is a inner, in, inner man, in the heart, in the mind. Listen, God's law said thou shalt not lust. Good luck with that one. The only way that righteousness of that law will ever be fulfilled in you to get rid of lust in your flesh is for the Spirit of God. The Spirit lusteth against the what? Flesh. Right? The only way that that lust and that sin can be put to death in your body is by the Spirit of Almighty God ministered by faith through His Word. And so righteousness is a gift of God. Eternal life is a gift of God through what? Righteousness. Right? Righteousness is received by grace. Anybody? Y'all need me to leave this up here? We didn't get a whole lot wrote down anyway. Leave it up there? Okay. Um, any questions? Going once, going twice. Sold to Bill Caner. <laughs> Uh, next, next week we're going to look at Paul's uh, description of the law there in Romans 7. This positional identity delivers me. That's the final section in this. The final section is deliverance from the law. This, this is a beautiful stuff what we're getting ready to see. It's a woman bound by the law to her husband. The husband's dead. We've been joined to him that is raised from the dead and therefore we're delivered from the law to serve in newness of spirit. When you get over here, he's going to talk about the flesh and the spirit and how one of these days we're not just going to be serving in newness of spirit, we're getting a new body. Right? The spirit is now working in us in eternal glory. That's what the, that's what the ministration of the spirit is doing, is working glory in our inner man. And one of these days... That inner man, that glorified man is getting a glorified body to inhabit. The new man that's now in me, the new creature. And that new man in me being formed by the Spirit of God, the more he's formed, Bill, the more I groan. More and more for that new body. Yeah. Amen. Oh, isn't it good stuff? Yeah. Isn't it good stuff? You guys, just, you guys got more Bible this morning out of these two services and what they'll, what they'll get 12 years. Oh. Sorry, Gary. <laughs> it's a habit. It's a habit. Uh, go ahead and pray, Gary. Father, God, we do thank you today, Lord, for the teaching of the Word of God. Thank you for our pastor. Speak in your name, Lord. Bring him to the place. Now, pray for the one that couldn't make this morning for Jessica. Help her to fix. Pray for her. Pray for Dick. Pray for the two. Pray for Kenny and Barney.
so if you go to, if we go to your church website,